Well, bless the Lord. Um, we're going to continue in our study of Acts, uh, the writing of Acts today. Um, we have been following uh, Paul on, you know, some of the journeys that he took, um, which as we can see, were very clearly led by the Spirit of God. Uh, there were both places that, that Paul had intended to go with some of his companions, as well as places that uh, he didn't intend to go, that the Lord redirected, um, you know, which makes me want to mention and review uh, some of our perspective uh, comments and understanding about the, the writing. Um, And that is that, uh, you know, this, this particular writing, uh, this portion of scripture has been used by many as a, as a manual uh, to, you know, almost like a rule book as to how they start ministries or churches or uh, revivals or whatever that may be. Uh, yeah. You know, one of, the most, one of the most common ways that that is referenced is, you know, we want to do things like the New Testament church. And so... <clears throat> They look at the events, decisions, and actions that were made in this book as a reference point and, you know, a manual as to how to do those things. Um, I maintain that that is not necessarily a, a, a healthy approach to this writing. Um, another thing that we mentioned is that other people, that most contemporary theology will look at this writing again and say it was a transitional period and while I would re agree with that description I would not agree with it for the same reason and the reasoning behind most thought is that you know God did things with people via the Holy Spirit in a way in uh, in these people's lives in a way that he doesn't do now anymore because we have the whole of scripture therefore we don't need the Holy Spirit plus no one had ever had the Holy Spirit before and they were receiving the Holy Spirit, and some did and some didn't, and it's not like that anymore. You know, so these are some of the doctrinal understandings and theological arguments for um, what was going on here in Acts. Um, so to clarify, uh, not just my personal standing, but to put into context both the reality that this was a transitional period uh, immediately following the resurrection, the life, the death, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. There was a great transition, but I would, I would think that it is better to equate this transition to the message that was preached by both the, the, the prophets of old, the more recent prophets like John the Baptist, Jesus himself, and to hear what their message was. You know, in, in a very simplistic phrase, the message was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is now. It is coming. It is here. And, you know, there are a lot of things that most of us take for granted of and are for granted in our own way of thinking. Um, or we over, in, by, by that, I mean, we oversimplify what we're actually even thinking and talking about. For instance, it's easy for us to think about kingdom and have very little thoughts about it. We think of thrones, palaces, castles, knights, battles, ruling areas, and movies. Maybe we can throw in certain heroes and noble characters, but that is really the extent of our idea of a kingdom. So if we study history, then we may also include ideas of uh, tyrants, wicked rulers, and those who used their power in ways that were detrimental. So that would be, you know, the, the, the vast difference between a noble king and a wicked king. And so maybe that's the, the extent of our understanding of kingdom. Kingdom, however, was not something that was unfamiliar to uh, 
the, the word of God through the prophets of old, all through history of the Israelites, and also into this time during this period of the Acts, uh, uh, when this book, when these writings were written. And I can assure you that their understanding of kingdom was very different. And I can also recommend that we spend a little bit more time understanding the nature of what a kingdom is. It's not just those certain people and players. More importantly, a kingdom, and, and I recognize this more myself within the last couple of years, having read a little bit more of uh, some more recent history, you know, maybe the last 500 to 1,000 years. Maybe a little more than that, but you know, one thing that was uh, I don't I, I I'm gonna shame myself by not remembering the details. <clears throat> I think it was the in the some of the Germanic kingdoms, but there were I read about a you know there was always kingdoms being disrupted or usurped or thrown over by other incoming kingdoms and ruling empires. And there was one that what they knew they didn't have the military power to uh, to overtake the current ruling order, uh, the kingdom that was ruling, but they wanted the change. And so their methodology was very subtle in that they sent uh, individuals and families and, and they kept doing so. But these individuals and families and groups of people were sent literally and actually to create a culture in the places that they wanted to rule over. And it took time. And uh, that actually ended up being the overturning of those powers at that time because they were able to actually develop this culture in the midst of these areas in people. And it was agreeable to the people. And so because the hearts of the people changed and were given over to this new way of life and to a different ruling order, then eventually that became itself the ruling order. And while there's a lot of parallels to the kingdom of God in that, I, what I want to just focus on briefly, or for the for the sake of making this point, is that that is what that's more a, a more accurate understanding of what a kingdom is. It's a it 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 is representative of a way of life, and with that way of life, there is also a ruling order, and there are rulers who are put in places of authority not only to you know put the rod down on the people's backs but to show them how that kingdom works to begin to and that was you know that was what was intriguing about uh, this 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 historical happening that I was talking about is that they were spreading an idea and they began to practice that idea and so it became a reality for them, where, where in essence there was no kingdom. A kingdom was developed. And so, you know, I, I, I mentioned that so that we have a little bit more broad, and I'm not saying that I have, you know, the, the, the end-all definition of, excuse me, or description of what a kingdom is. What I would encourage our listeners and ourselves to, to, to do is to think, uh, it's to me that's now that I have come to a, a point of a greater realization. That's not just uh, a, a, a basic understanding per se. It's uh, it's something that we need to. It just makes me realize how little I think of of things that actually are not little at all. And so when we take that and we apply it to biblical truth and the purpose of God, man, how how widely do we miss the mark? Well, I would say we may not even be hitting the target. I would further say, maybe even boldly say, maybe we don't even know what the target is if we don't understand that aspect of God's purpose. 
because it's not a new proclamation on God's part. It came very early in, when God was expressing what his intention is and was. In fact, it came at the very beginning when we, when we correlate it and understand that that is the very command that was given to Adam and Eve when he said, rule. Rule over. That is and always has been God's intention. And so to come to kind of bring this back to Acts, you know, obviously there we're in the time of history when the Roman Empire is ruling over uh, the, most of the world. It's the, 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 the biggest empire. We are, we are in direct alignment with the prophetic uh, revelations that were given to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel, and others about the kingdoms of the, that would come and rule over the earth. We've studied those scriptures. We've seen both man's view of what those kingdoms would be represented in Nebuchadnezzar's dream as this beautiful statue of many different uh, types of materials. But we also saw in that very dream the degradation of the kingdoms of man all the way to a point of mixture, which would ultimately be a weakness. Now, God himself viewed those same kingdoms as beasts coming out of the earth as they, they, they came to rule over mankind. So God had a very different view. So again, in the two different representations, we see the kingdom of God represented in a very specific way. But we need to keep in mind that it's not something that just comes and crushes and then everybody's happy and we have the, the happy Walt Disney ending where the, you know, the two people that loved each other got together or the good guy wins, but we have no idea what happens with the rest of his life. The whole point of the kingdom of God is what happens with the rest of life because that's when that ruling order has its true impact and produces the fruit for which it fought to gain the ground for. Now, interestingly, God gave and gained the ground on many occasions for his people, but never saw the fruit produce. Therefore, his judgment came. So it wasn't a matter of whether or not the right ground was given. It was that the people were never, in a sense, sown in it and able to produce the right fruit. So listen again to the message of John the Baptist, to the message of Jesus early on in his ministry. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. What do we need to do? Well, a new ruling order is coming in. You need to make way for it. Clear the path. Get the big rocks out of the highway. Remove all the stumbling blocks. Get the thorns and the thistles where they grow over. So that the king, the ruler of this new way of life, can come in. And what does he do? Just sit on his throne and we all cheer and have a party. And, you know, he gives us our bread for the, for the celebration. And we go home and then live our own life. As if the king is not sitting on his throne. As if he is not the ruler that we have celebrated as if there is not a, 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 a standard and way of life that comes with that king and his rule and his order and that the king does not have servants in his own house who carry that same standard and rule and order and are sent out to the areas, to the far reaches of that kingdom to make those rules, those laws, that order, this way of life to make sure that that is the way that the kingdom is being operated? That's what a kingdom is. That's the function of a kingdom. So we need to get whatever ideas out of our mind that, that the, the idea of a kingdom is all about the simply about the noble victory or the victory of a noble man or a hero and, you know, therefore, we can do whatever we want because we have a guy that's the good guy up top. So we're free now. We have a good ruler without 
a knowledge and expectation that 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 ruler represents a way of life and that that there are things that are acceptable sure good things but there are also things that are unacceptable they have to be made known there are, are ways of interaction and commerce in dealings with other people that are now put in a standard practice and they can't be denied. So, you know, we see some of that begin to happen, you know, functionally, even within the Roman Empire with Paul. Uh, on one occasion already and another coming up, he has, he has done what? Proclaimed his, his citizenship because when the Roman Empire came into power and they governed in a different way, they were not barbaric. They wanted to make sure that, that crimes, when there was punishment for crimes, it was not met out by the people in their rage and passion, but that people were given a fair trial so that they could understand what crime was done and then make a, you know, hopefully a righteous decision on whether the person was guilty of the crime or not, or whether it even was a crime. We see that happening here. We understand, you know, Paul understood very well the ruling order of the day, and he did not uh, disrespect it. He did not take it for granted. He used it to his advantage. It didn't change his message, but it was the ruling order of life, this way of life, which interestingly, again and again and again throughout these chapters and acts, we see the, 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 this way of life literally be presented as, in, 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 by word, as the way. So I want us to, to really nail down the fact and the reality that what the message that they were preaching was not simply Jesus lived, he was a righteous man, he died, he rose again, he's in heaven, he died for our sin, therefore everything's okay now because our righteous king sits on his throne, then we can do whatever we want because we're protected by a benevolent ruler. That's not the message. There was a message of salvation for sure. The presentation of what sin was went beyond, you know, idol worship and sexual immorality and stealing and cheating and murdering. It tied in, and you can see it in the messages of Peter and Paul and Stephen and others. It was tied into God's eternal purpose for man and his intention to have a people for himself who lived in a perfect, a particular way. And by that, which was given to them, this representation through the law, which itself was perfect, but imperfect because of the weakness of man's flesh. So Jesus came in the flesh, fulfilling the law and producing the fruit that God intended to be produced in a man's life, but didn't want to leave it at that. He still wanted a people, a kingdom, who would produce the fruit as a people, as a family. That's the message. So the message went beyond even those words. It went into, okay, what are the standards of this kingdom? What are the ways? How do we live? What does it mean? How, is, how does the governance of this way work in our lives? So Paul took great pains to remain in the places that he traveled as long as he could and as long as the Lord allowed to be able to convey that message. You know, when Paul, when we, when we read that Paul and Barnabas or Paul and Silas with Timothy, when they stayed in a place for a year, year and a half, two years, do we really think that the message that they preached day in, day out, every week in the synagogue was Jesus died and rose again. He's in heaven now, so you can go to heaven and have your sins forgiven. And that people continually came. No, in fact, when he, when he, when he preached messages of salvation, the people came and said, what? Tell us more about this way. Tell us more about who this man was. The name and the way were the two ways, the two ways that it's described in this, this book. 
the name and the ways. The name is representative of Jesus Christ, the man, yes, but more than just that person as a man. What did his life represent? What did he teach? What did he do? How did he live? What was his relationship to God? What ruling order did he follow? That's the exact question that the rulers always ask Jesus. By what authority do you do these things? By what authority do you say what you say? Who who do you represent? You see, these people, they understood the terminology of the of kingdom. And they didn't take it lightly. We live in a country that takes those kinds of standards very lightly. Because we live in a country where every man does what's right in his own eyes. And lobbies for it at a governmental level. The greatest agenda currently is that everybody should be able to do whatever they want. There are no standards. There are no morals. It's just whatever the person feels is right to them, not for others. How opposite is that? And if we think that that has not permeated our thinking, we're just wrong. That thinking is so pervasive that it's causing uh, it's it's causing riots and uproars across the world now because everybody wants that kind of quote unquote freedom to do whatever they want, to be whatever they want, to go wherever they want, to say whatever they want, without any constraint, without any consequence for what it may mean, not only to their own life, but to the lives of others. So, the concept of kingdom is important. And it's absolutely the message that was taken out. But there was a lot to that message. Conveyed with and in that message was the presentation and the teaching of the way of life. And that's when we can go back to the teachings of Jesus Christ to better understand this way of life. And when we, when we move into the teachings of the Apostle Paul and Peter and James and John through their letters, through their own revelations, and through their own growth and maturity of what that life had become in them and their understanding of it, then we get a more clear picture. So I will kind of come full round here and say, Acts, the book of Acts does not give that full picture. Therefore, it should not be a manual. But don't hear me talking against this writing. This is an incredibly important writing. To me, we see what it looks like when this kingdom begins to, to make an advancement and a progress in our own hearts and minds and the, 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 the things that resist it. And also when we see literally the, the kingdom of God begin to take make an advancement in the midst of a people. In an area, in a locale, you're going to see this kind of resistance. You're going to face these kinds of trials. You're going to see these kinds of wonderful things happen. And the overall uh, uh, picture of, of how it happens isn't because of a, a particular methodology. It is literally by the leading, by the power, and by the sending and movement and direction of the Holy Spirit. Now that correlates with Paul's teachings as well about everyday life. So let's have the right perspective. I, I, I don't feel bad at all to continue to repeat that because I feel, my I understand that this writing has been very abused by the people of God. Used to substantiate and even to carve out the idols of religion. 
Nothing good about that. Bears no good testimony to the lives that were given for it. The blood that was shed. When we honor them in the way that they follow Christ, in the way that Christ yielded to the Father, then we do some honor to the purpose of God and to the lives of those who were given to it. That's Paul's testimony as well. I don't think we'll get to it today, but he gives a testimony coming soon when he's in Jerusalem to his own brethren, the Jews, saying, I thought that way too. That was also my opinion to such an extent that I practiced it with great vigor and zeal. But God intervened and showed me this way. So this is the continuation of the, the travels of Paul. Chapter 17, now we see that Paul is headed to Thessalon, uh, excuse me, Thessalonica, uh, Thessalonica. And as was his usual custom, even as it was with Jesus, he went to the local synagogues, the Jewish synagogues, uh, to uh, teach, to share the message of the way, to declare the name. And he was constantly troubled by the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders. Verse 2 says, as his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue and on the and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. Now what's interesting about Paul's message was not just a proof of Jesus himself, but he reasoned with the people through the scriptures. In other words, he was bringing in the context of God's purpose in and through the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. So, why was that the, why did Christ, why did God ordain long ago this way of life for the Messiah and the suffering, death, and resurrection? For the salvation of sin, yes, to save mankind from not being able to fulfill the purpose for which he was created, that being sin, yes. And in that, to show them the right way to live. A new way of life. A different way of life. So therefore, if Jesus Christ was this Messiah, through whom God had every intention of fulfilling his will, and he did, then we need to pay attention to his teachings. In his way of life. Again, I, I want to show you here, that is the message Paul was preaching. And it is the content of his teaching. I can, as I read this particular scripture here in verse 2 and 3, I was reminded uh, of Moses' own words. In Deuteronomy 18. So let's turn there briefly. Uh, <clears throat> Deuteronomy 18, and uh, starting in verse 14. You know, they, they had received the law at this time, God was presenting to them a way of life. Moses looks ahead, speaks prophetically of the Messiah. The nations you will possess, verse 14, listen to those who practice sorcery, 
The nations you will dispossess listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. You know, that's mentioned in the upcoming uh, verses in Acts as well, where Paul meets, you know, for instance, a Jewish sorcerer, one who practices the, the, the art of uh, religion in, in a different way, in an, in an un, uh, unprescribed way. And God specifically says here through Moses, those are the people that God is taking this land away from. You will dispossess those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. It's a wrong way of life. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses, from among your own brothers, you must listen to him. You know, is it that G that was speaking of Christ? Listening to him means he will show you and teach you and lead you in this way of life. In what God expects from you. For this is what you ask of the Lord, your God at Horeb on the day of assembly. When you said, let us not hear the voice of our Lord God, nor see his great fire anymore. or You will die. So the Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. And if anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. Now that's a, an exact reflection of, of the words of Jesus who said, I don't say anything that I don't hear my father saying. And I only do what I see the Father doing. Jesus regular on, on regular occurrences called to the crowds of the people and those who were surrounding him and said, come over here, listen to me. I have words of life for you. Hear what I'm saying. Let him who has an ear hear this message. Even after his resurrection and, and ascension to the throne of God, and in his Jesus' own reception of the revelation that the Father gave to him, and then when he came to give that revelation to the Apostle John, he said these same things. And if the message was that substantial, we need to have, we ought to listen more carefully. Paul says that on many occasions. It was encour his encouragement wherever he went. The Jews accused him of teaching and preaching something new. But he always said, no. Man, please understand where I come from. This isn't new. This is what God always wanted to do. We just didn't understand how he wanted to do it. And what it really meant. So here's how he is doing it. And here's what it means. And this day that became. The, the way of describing it. Became the way. And the message was according to the name. But we see consistently that the Jews. The religious leaders. Those who were held tightly to their former way of life, traditions, and otherwise, resented, were jealous of, attacked, sought to kill those who promoted this new way of life. So, too, we find here that they were looking to seek uh, Paul's life again, and they sent him to Berea. You know, the Bereans are worth reading about, Verse 10, it says, as soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea, and on arriving there, they again went to the Jewish synagogue. Now, the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great earnestness, and what did they do with the message? They examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. See, Paul was preaching and teaching from the scriptures. So they said, okay, 
then let's look again at the scriptures. And it says, many of the Jews believed, as also a number of prominent Greek women and Greek men. Not because, simply because they were students, intellectual students of the scriptures, but because they were hearing the truth and reality of the message that Paul was speaking, and it was being revealed to them when they looked again. Because there was something in their hearts. This is a mention here by Luke. They were of more noble character. What does that really mean here? It means they were willing. There was, su- there was a matter of willingness in their heart. What they didn't understand, they didn't resist. They wanted to search it out. Many people equate this to intellectual knowledge of the scriptures. No, this was a heart matter. Something in them was touched and they wanted to find truth. So the word of God himself was activated in them by the power of the spirit. When God said, if you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me, if you search for me with your whole heart. So many believed. We see a more regular occurrence happening at this point where there were those that literally chased Paul around trying to cause trouble. So the very next verse, when the Jews in Thessalonica, where he had just come from, heard that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, the word of God, the message of the kingdom, they went there too, agitating the crowds, stirring them up, and so they uh, sent them away again. Paul then is, is on his own for a little while in Athens, and he goes to some, uh, 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 he's, he's, you know, disturbed by the number of idols and worship of the various, you know, the uh, many gods there. Um, he finds himself coming up to, or he's brought to the Areopolis, which was a, a high place in Athens. And he begins to speak uh, to these philosophers and shares a message of the God that they, you know, that the, he, he, he saw that they had a, a shrine or something like that to the unknown God. And Paul uses that as an opportunity to fill that void with the, the, the true God. And it says that they, they, uh, they considered uh, deeply what he was saying. So he, that description of, of who he describes this unknown God as is in uh, uh, verses 24 uh, through 31. And it says that when they, verse 32, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. Now, you know, Paul was, his presentation here is not just about Jesus Christ raising from the dead, but a testimony or a testament of, a, of an indestructible life. And that is going to come up a, a number of times. Uh, it already has and will continue to because, as we have mentioned before, the message was a new way of life that is sourced from a new, uh, that also has a new source of life, that being from above. And that's as being the only way to fulfill, to walk in, to live in this new way of life. So verse 34 says, a few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, and also a woman named Damaris and a number of others. So then Paul leaves Athens and goes to Corinth um, again. Uh, He is rejected by the Jews. He does uh, form uh, a a very special and unique relationship with uh, husband and wife, Priscilla and Aquila, there in Corinth. Uh, More about uh, these individuals and Paul's time with them and the teachings that he offered to uh, the believers in Corinth is obviously recorded in the letters to, to the Corinthians in our Bibles. That's called 1 and 2 Corinthians. Um, we see verse 11 describing, and, and this is in verse 18. Uh, interestingly, the, Jesus speaks to Paul 
personally and says, continue to do what you are doing in obedience uh, because I'm protecting you in this place. Um, I have many who belong to me in this city. And so he said, you know, do this. So it says, verse 11, so Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. Again, what is it that we imagine that Paul was doing during this year and a half? He was very intentional, very purposeful about what he was doing. His message was not uh, repetitive in the sense that it was, you know, I don't know what we think. Do we think that it was just, you know, believe in Jesus and be saved and be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit? And that was it every time. You know, what was he teaching? He wasn't teaching the New Testament. There was no, there was no New Testament. He was writing letters. But he was teaching the scriptures. That's all of the Old Testament. That's the law of Moses. He was revealing the purpose of God in the scriptures. And we need to understand very clearly, the scriptures did not include any of the New Testament yet. So he was teaching them the way of life that God had presented and offered and desired of his people. For many, many generations past. He's teaching the words of the prophets. He was teaching them from the lives of David and Solomon, Saul, the other kings of Israel. From the promises that came through the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How do we know that? Is that an assumption on my part? No. Read Paul's letters. That's exactly what he was teaching them. He wanted them to understand the kingdom of God, the purpose of God. So again, uh, they were they stirred up uh, uh, some major disagreements against Paul. They tried to have him killed, but he was brought before the rulers in the area and they were actually defended him. So we see that happen uh, towards the end that the, the, the accusers, those who brought him against the Roman courts there were then beat by the the Jews themselves, because they didn't accomplish what they had wanted to. Um, and then Paul spends more time with Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, and then he continues to sell on to Ephesus. Um, but what was Paul doing all in all? Discipleship through his teaching, culture building through his teaching, and through his way of life, through the example of his life. So again, we see that he spent time in Antioch. What was he doing there? Verse 23, after spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there, traveled, and doing what? Strengthening all the disciples. You don't strengthen a disciple with the salvation message. You strengthen a disciple who is a follower with more truth about how to live this way of life by solidifying the standard the culture that comes with that kingdom. So here we're also introduced to Apollos, who is mentioned in some of the other uh, writings of Paul uh, in some of the letters. Uh, Apollos was uh, a wonderful believer, a, a, a brilliant teacher, and was also a, a willing uh, servant, able to learn. It says here uh, that Priscilla and Aquila came to him this is verse 26, uh, after he had been teaching in the synagogue, and when Priscilla Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and ex to explain him what? The way of God more adequately. So Paul had already spent enough time with Priscilla and Aquila to enable them to pass on this culture and way of life. And it became an addition to, a benefit to Apollos in his teaching. That's why when Paul you know, writes in his letters about the competition about whether we follow a Paul or Apollos, he says, wait a minute, there's a whole bigger issue here. It's about the way. It's about this kingdom. It's about this, the king of this kingdom and about the way of life. It's not about the individual. So Paul continues in chapter 9 uh, in Ephesus. And uh, he uh, talks to them because many of these were followers uh, of Apollos. Um, and 
he had previously only taught, Apollos that is, John's baptism, that being one of repentance. And so Paul comes in, he says, well, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Jesus, uh, uh, so he makes a comparison, not a comparison, but um, explaining the difference between the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus. So he says in verse 4, John's baptism was the baptism of repentance as he told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is Jesus. So preparing the way. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. They spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So he continued to speak in the synagogues there for several months, arguing persuasively about what? The way, the name, the kingdom of God, its standards, its ruler, its ruling way of life. These things are very evident. But what was the resistance? Some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe in what? Publicly maligned the way. We don't want that culture. We don't want to follow that way of life. So they began to cause trouble. But the Lord continued to cause the message to be spread further and further. So verse 8 there, we see another mentioning uh, that he went on, verse 10 it says, this went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. The message of this kingdom, the message of this way of life was being uh, forcefully advancing. Um, and again, I want to reiterate, uh, restate again, what is it that we think that Paul was teaching? Just a salvation message? It wasn't. He didn't go for two years house to house sharing the modern day gospel. He was laying a foundation for this way of life. When we change our perspective and context of what we actually think the apostles and the disciples were doing during this time of history, then we will understand more about the nature of of the kingdom of God and have a better context to receive and implement and practice the culture of God's house. So he taught the kingdom of God. We see others that were practicing their own ideas. It's mentioned here in verses 13 and, and through 18 with the seven sons of Sceva. And I want to use this as an example of the function of a kingdom which comes with authority and power. Rulers. Names and titles are not the important part. But again, a reference to under what authority, by what name do you do what you do? Do you have the authority? to act and live as you do. And the seven sons of Sceva are an example of someone who act on someone else's authority but are not submitted to the ways of that ruling order. The demons were not unaware of it. How did they respond? How did this demon or this group of demons respond to the seven sons of Sceva? I mean, they came and they said, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. The Spirit says, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul. I know what grace and power and authority has been given him in this kingdom. Who are you? So the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all and gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Uh, this is not a story about how to cast out demons. This is an example 
of how authority and power operate in the context of a kingdom. There is a standard, an operating standard. And there is a given authority that comes with a ruling order. So it says that when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. What's the, oh, wow, we better really honor this king and his ways. Let's look at this from a very practical standpoint. The kingdom comes in and there's a city or a people that rebel against the kingdom and he goes and stomps down the rebellion then there may be those who say, wow, this kingdom really has authority and power. We better submit to it. Now, that's as far as I'll go with the example because too many of the kingdoms of man are only represented by unrighteous ways, selfishness, and, and other things. That is very, very much not the case with the kingdom of God. But I do want to use it as an example of the the operation and function of kingdom, power, and authority. Jesus taught on these very same things as well. So there was a somewhat of a revival among the people there. They got rid of all their, uh, you know, their sorcery books, and they burned them. And um, then Paul decides that it's time for him to go to Rome. In the meantime, a great riot uh, arose in Ephesus. They tried to capture Paul and and kill him. Uh, but he, uh, the, the, again, the, the rulers of the area uh, that who were, I just find this very inter interesting because you, in this section of Acts in particular, you find you, you, you need to have a keen observation of the, the operating power of the kingdoms that were ruling at the time because here again Paul is literally saved by the the operating standard and ruling authority of the Roman Empire so we see these two kingdoms in operation and the 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 effects of the orders and the authorities that were given to them to work out and so I, my presentation isn't about whether the Roman, Roman Empire was good or bad because Paul was saved by their rules. But I want us to see the operation of the kingdom, the operation of how a ruling order works in the midst of a people. Because that's what we're seeing being developed by God in the midst of his own people. So uh, the, um, the, the, this, this riot is quelled down, and then uh, Paul continues his travels on through Macedonia and Greece. Um, again, he faces various plots by the Jews to capture him and kill him, uh, and then he comes for a, 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 some final meetings uh, with the brethren, um, in these areas, and then ultimately in um, in Ephesus before heading to Rome. There's a lot of sadness because Paul knows that he will be going to his death, so he would not be uh, in this in this life able to return to those cities and see their faces again. And that was a time of of, of sadness and mourning for them. But um, you know, Paul was uh, keen to see. Uh, his own life be used by God in the way that he intended. Um, you know, as another reference to the time that, that Paul spent with these people and what it was about, and we see an example of that in verses 7 through 12 of chapter 20, where he was in the upper room and speaking, and, you know, we have this miraculous thing happen where the young man, Eutychus, uh, gets very tired in the middle of the night because Paul came and spoke all the way through the night into the morning. And my question to you is, what was he speaking to believers about? Was he again sharing the message of salvation, believe in Jesus? No. He was teaching them about the way of life. He was revealing it to them in the scriptures. He was 
trying to strengthen them in their understanding to be able to live this life in this way, to produce this culture in their midst. And he knew his time was short, so he was taking advantage of whatever he had. In the middle of this, this young man falls out of the window and dies. And Paul raises him back to life, and they eat together, and he continues teaching. <laughs> so, uh, again, I would, I would want us to focus not so much on the miracle, but what do we think Paul was teaching? Why is teaching necessary? Why is it necessary for us to take time to consider, to apply to realize these truths as reality so that they become a practice in our midst and are able to produce good fruit for God and what he wanted to see produced in the midst of his people. That was Paul's passion. That's why he did it. That's why he was so driven. So he offers his fare farewells. And, uh, you know, verse 25, ultimately he says, um, prior to that, Verse 22, he says, now compelled by the spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that in prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me according to his will and for his purpose the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. What God has given to enable the fulfillment of his purpose. Paul says, I'm given over to that. My life is given over to it. Paul describes this in many different ways in his letters uh, a little bit more intimately because he's writing directly. This is an observation made by Luke, and we're going to see a little bit more intimate presentation of Paul's understanding uh, as we go through uh, some of the epistles. So, you know, verse 25, then he says, Now I know none of you among, uh, among whom I have now gone out preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. So he, you know, shares an encouraging message to them. So he says here, uh, verse 28, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God. So he's meeting with the leaders which he bought with his own blood. And I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come among you and will not spare the flock. So he is encouraging them to keep the way, to uphold the standard that has been taught. So and he does that even with tears. Verse 31, be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears about the resistance that you will face in teaching and practicing this way of life. Now I commit to you, commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's gold or silver or clothing. You yourselves know that I've supplied everything for my own needs and my companions. So he gives one last testimony of his way of life in the midst of others. And uh, we'll finish there today, ending in chapter uh, 21, because he heads uh, from there to Jerusalem and begins to go to testify before the courts in these cities and places as the Lord said he would. And this is why Paul had the assurance that he did in taking the message even to the place that he knew that his own life would be taken uh, for the sake of of the message. So we will finish there today. Bless the Lord that he had servants like Paul who were uh, unselfish and were willing, even as his own son Jesus Christ, to, to be obedient to whatever appointment that God had for them. So we are thankful for them for the testimony. I pray that the message of the kingdom of God and the message of the way of the life of God will not only find good soil in our own hearts, but be produced in us and among us as a true, real way of life, both in our inner man and in our walk 
in this world and to wherever God has us to be. So, amen. We'll stop there today. Amen. Amen. That's so encouraging. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Amen.